Greetings, fair listeners. It's co-host Jeremy here. We have another Rewind episode for you while we're on break. It's September now, so I'm getting all my Halloween decorations up. And I have chosen the roaches, which I was going to pick literally as soon as I could get away with picking as a Rewind episode. There's many artists we've covered that, you know, I just get an inkling like, oh, I want to hear that again. But this Roaches album is easily the album that has most grabbed me out of anything we've covered. It's the one people are like, I need something new to listen to. What do I check out? This is the one I send them right away. So if you didn't listen to this episode, now's the time. And now's the time for you to go listen to the roaches as well. But yeah, I'm 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 a little afraid of what's going to happen and whether they win or lose. I'm planning on not really leaving the house today. <laughs> mm-hmm. Now's when you can get away with crimes, though. You got to yeah, prepare for that. <laughs> this right. is your golden opportunity. <laughs> It's very quiet outside right now. So after this is done, I'm planning on going out and uh, doing grocery shopping and driving around. Anything that involves traffic, you know, the other. (laughs) Let's go do some crimes. Yeah. You should do some crimes. Yeah, you should eat some sushi and not pay for it. (laughs) (laughs) And then burn down the sushi establishment. Yes. Now we're talking. Right. Welcome to I'd Buy That for a Dollar, a podcast about inexpensive, common, and underappreciated records that are waiting to be rediscovered. I'm your host, Sean Hartman, Director of Tourism and Business Development for Hammond, Louisiana, where we love to say, we are not just the place from that Roaches song. <laughs> That's an interesting PR approach. It's, you gotta start somewhere. Well, I could use some PR myself, guys. I'm co-host Jeremy. I applied for a job at a restaurant, and this rude owner, Mr. (laughs) Selleck, he says to me, we don't need any damned old dogs. (laughs) And I cried, and I left. I wept. I got all over the steam table. (laughs) Well, I'm I'm sorry to hear that, Jeremy. I... I know you're always looking for new occupations. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Happens frequently. Well, I am co-host Peter Cook, and I'm in trouble here. I, I look down, and I'm realizing now that we're going to be talking about the roaches. All of my these are my notes for the Johnny Hammond episode. I got confused with <laughs> Hammond song. I got all these notes on the B3 Hammond organ. <laughs> Well, you are always so confused, Peter. Yeah, thanks for sharing your the troubles with us. Oh wow, we're oh we we can't play all these songs. We can't feature all these songs that we're referencing in this intro here. Um, well, sounds like yeah. it might be quitting time. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, I think we, we can. <laughs> <laughs> Who else do we have here? Hi, I'm Taylor Rowley, and as a point of interest, I spell my last name R-O-W-L-E-Y, and I don't give out my age or my phone number. (laughs) It's good to get that out in front, (laughs) let people know what to expect. (laughs) We are Sean and Jeremy and Peter and Taylor. Yes. For this episode of I'd Buy That for a Dollar. Welcome back, Taylor. Sixth time on. Yeah. It's an album that I think you were meant to come onto the podcast and talk to us about. What did you bring us? I'm thrilled to be on this episode uh, talking about this album, which is one of my very favorites, thrift store or otherwise. It is the 1979 album, self-titled album by The Roaches. 
correct. On Warner Brothers. Yes. The major major release, but kind of found a, a cult audience, wouldn't you say? Definitely. They kind of were briefly in the mainstream and kind of existed on the outskirts of it for the rest of their career. Yeah. And we'll talk more about that. But how about we give them a little taste of the roaches? Where do we want to start? We are going to hear the first side or the first track off the first side of the record called We. And I think the song, they speak for themselves. We'll, uh, we'll let them introduce who they are. Yeah. Yeah. We won't need to do a bio for this episode. They're going <laughs> to yeah. tell us the whole thing, their exactly. whole story, at mm-hmm. least up to the point of their debut as a trio. So, all right, let's do that. Side A, track one. We are Maggie and Terry and Suzzy. To my knowledge, my recollection, had a song on the podcast with an obscenity prior to this. You know, oh. we just last episode, Todd Rundgren had a song about the shit hitting the fan, <laughs> but we didn't feature that song. I believe Sean did put that on the exclusive monthly playlist that is now available on our Patreon. That Todd Rundgren song, but I did here. Here the roaches. Here the roaches are. You did do that, Sean? Yeah, right next to Temporary Secretary. Nice. I'm Paul <laughs> McCartney. Uh, but here here the roaches are dropping the S-bomb on us in the opening track. <laughs> Filthy. <laughs> and yeah, you know, it's a, it's a kitschy, wonderful introduction to the roaches. Yeah, I think it really establishes their sense of humor. If you didn't like that, though, let me just say to the listeners, because this is my first time hearing The Roaches, and when that song played, I was like, okay, that's kind of silly, but I don't like this yet. Mm-hmm. But wait for it. It's coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That that emphasizes sort of the vaudevillian aspect of their existence. Totally. <laughs> They toe the line very well between being like, let me just say that I, I, I'm on record as saying that I cannot stand what I call funny music. Same. And they, yeah, I just, I hate it. I hate it all. Tenacious D, like (laughs) fly to the Concords. Like, I mean, anything like that where there's just jokes and stuff I don't like. And uh, I think they toe the line between being 
a little obnoxious and being to- like very witty and endearing. Yeah, I was going to say they have a very endearing brand of humor because I as well have a very limited tolerance for humor and music. I think I just sold most of my vocal Frank Zappa records recently. <laughs> like, yeah. But this one, I, I still like it. I mean, there's a couple songs that I don't love as much as the others, but overall, I, I think their whole aesthetic works really, really well, and they do toe the line. Yeah. And I don't want to get too ahead of ourselves here, but they were very, whoever laid out the sequencing on this record, the track listing, was very smart to follow it up, the song up, <laughs> with the song we'll be talking about soon. Because yeah. then you're just like, if you had any da- you know, fears that it was going to be all like that, they're quickly dashed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember when I first listened to this album a couple years ago, it, it was definitely after the pandemic had hit. And I I knew the Roach's name, and I was one morning, it was when I first had to start going back into the office after a couple months of working from home. And just one morning, halfway on my way to work, I was like, who are the Roaches? I you know, kind of know the era they're from. I know that they're siblings, but I didn't couldn't think that I'd ever heard their music knowingly. And I put this album on, and that's the first thing I heard. And I was like, okay, you know, I they're telling me all about themselves. So I, I, I'm, I'm learning things about them. But then, yeah, you, you, you get through this opening track and you get into the album and the song that we're going to feature next. And suddenly you're in a whole new world, <laughs> an experience, mm-hmm. uh, a whole new experience, uh, musical and beyond, it feels like. And yeah, they, they they've created, they they carved out their own space there wasn't really anyone contemporary to them in the late seventies, early eighties that I can think of on at least on a little more high profile level doing what they were doing. Especially women. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. For sure. So yeah. So should I talk a little bit about their background? Yeah, who are beyond Maggie <laughs> and Terry and Suzzy, who are the Roaches? Okay, so Maggie, Terry, and Suzzy Roach are a trio of sisters. They are originally from Park Ridge, New Jersey, and they grew up singing together as children and teenagers. When Maggie and Terry were in high school, Maggie is the eldest, and she is the uh, the one with the very distinctive contralto voice in the group. She's the eldest, and Terry, who is the second eldest, uh, they left high school to become musicians. This is like in the late 60s. Um, They spent a few years kind of going around the coffee house circuit. I guess at one point around then in the early 70s, they barged into a songwriting class that was being taught by, at NYU, that was being taught by Paul Simon, who Maggie uh, Roach has said is her biggest influence. And they pretty much demanded that you know, that he allowed them in the class, which he did. Um, I guess he was pretty taken with their songwriting skills because then he um, he took an interest in them. He invited them to sing with him on a track called Was a Sunny Day on his record. There Goes Rhyme and Simon, which I think is 73. Am I right? And then I guess I'm right. <laughs> uh, sure. But then, no one, no one I... agreed or disagreed. And then he also, a couple years later, produced a few tracks on their on Terry and Maggie's record called uh, Seductive Reasoning. Suzzy was not in the group yet. Yeah, she's several years younger than Yes. And so, and um, yeah, so he produced it and he sang or uh, played guitar on it. That album was on Columbia and unfortunately didn't really go anywhere. And right after it was released and it was clear that, the, you know, the record label didn't know what to do with it. And they were pretty disheartened by the entire experience. They were like, we're not going to promote this album anymore. They moved to Hammond, Louisiana, which we'll talk more about soon. They had met a friend on their travels who had a kung fu school down there. So I think (laughs) they were either living there or working there. And they started, you know, developing more of their craft as songwriters. Eventually, they moved back to New York, where Suzzy was then taking acting classes and the three of them decided to start singing Christmas carols on the street, busking, and developed sort of a following doing that and started playing at venues like Folk City, where they were discovered by, well, a couple people. Linda Ronstadt and Phoebe Snow went and saw them play, and then a week later they performed their song Married Men, which we'll also talk about. 
They performed that on SNL together, and that really introduced the world to the Roaches. And then later that year, they were on SNL, like in November, I think. Oh, you're saying Phoebe Snow performed Married Phoebe Men? Snow, yes, yeah, sorry. Phoebe Snow and Linda Ronstadt went and saw the Roaches play at Folk City, and then they performed only a week later, Phoebe and Linda, uh, the Married Men, on SNL. And then six months later, the Roaches were on SNL. Yep, okay. Mostly because of that perf- you know, performance. Robert Fripp also saw them perform at the at, at Folk City. They didn't even know who he was, and he asked to be introduced to them. And then he uh, produced and played on the record. Yeah, Robert Fripp of King Crimson. Yes, exactly. Far out. <laughs> mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, not the most expected choice for production on this album. Not at all. But I think he... It makes sense to me, It though. does make sense in a way, especially if you're more familiar with some of the stuff Robert Fripp was doing outside of King Crimson. And I've read in some interviews that the Roaches said that that was the best producer they ever worked with. And he seemed to understand and appreciate their songwriting more so than anyone else. Mm -hmm. I could see that. Yeah, he came back for their third album as well. He produced that. He did. I also want to jump in with a note on the uh, Paul Simon class. It was... It was something of a master class that I believe only 10 people were allowed to take part in. And it was something that you had to like uh, submit for and then winners were selected. So then the Roaches just busted into this like semi-private <laughs> master class, played a song for Paul Simon. And he was so impressed that he then had them sing on his record. They, they seem yeah. to have a knack for just instantly charming other musicians like that. They... I, I read that after that class, he drove them home to New Jersey. Mm-hmm. And he he asked them if they thought that they were as good as Paul McCartney, and they said yes. <laughs> that's amazing. And he that's and he was really impressed by that, and I think that's why he you know really supported them in their career. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I like this album more than almost all Paul McCartney <laughs> songs I've ever heard. So, wow, bold Dang. statement. Dang, it has humor in it, and Jeremy still likes it more. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah, that is. High praise. Okay, so we are going to hear a song. Um, it sounds like it's based on their experiences. Uh, it was written by Maggie Roach, the eldest, um, about her and Terry's experience in Hammond, Louisiana, after Seductive Reasoning came out, and it's called The Hammond Song. All right, let's do that. Side A, track two.
me personally, that song was a revelation once it kicked on. It was, I was kind of on the fence, like, don't like funny music. This better not be some, like, they might be giants shit. Like, I'm not here for that. (laughs) And then this song came out, and I, like, straight up moved me. (laughs) I was like, wow. Yeah, I think I've never met anyone who isn't completely taken by that song. Like, of people who like all different kinds of music, if they hear that, they're like, I, that song is so great. And um, it's just amazing. Yeah, it's it's an all-timer for sure. Universally beloved. I'd put that up against any Paul McCartney song. <laughs> Set it right here. <laughs> yeah, it has so much going on. It's so beautiful. Yeah, and it's cryptic lyrically in a very beautiful way. Mm-hmm. Well, she's sort of telling, they're sort of telling a story from two sides of the coin. It's like sort of a conversation between, I would get, you know, I guess like a, maybe a parental figure and oh, a young person, I would say. I, I had read one interpretation that it's actually three perspectives. It's the parents oh. and then it's the the sister that was pursuing a love interest and then it's the other sister's perspective on the thing and it's the idea is to just give you this complete universal perspective on an event showing that it affects different people in different ways yeah it's it, it's a great how they divide up the vocal on it too mm-hmm. it, it helps watching them live them perform that live helps me understand the distinction between their different voices with Maggie mm-hmm, with mm-hmm. that low baritone contralto and then Terry up high and then Suzzy kind of right in the middle. Yeah. I also really love the guitar solo on there from Robert Fripp. It's very tasteful. Yeah. It blends really well with the vocals. I was reminded a little bit of Ernie Isley's guitar work on the Isley Brothers record we did. Where he's just really good at harmonizing with vocals using the guitar as a lead instrument. Yeah. On that one, Robert Fripp is credited as electric guitar on the album, but that one specifically, it is fripperies is how he's credited. And what that. are fripperies? I believe it's the effect that he's using. Mm, is it like okay. tape delay that he's using to create that sound? I, I don't know what the whole thing is i know that there's probably like books and articles about frippatronics <laughs> and right. all the different yeah. techniques and effects he was yeah. using but um the, the basics of it is that he viewed non-traditional guitar playing and effects and manipulation is just as important as the guitar playing and would often utilize those functions to create more like synthesizer like sounds than traditional guitar work there's also the intro that fades in which I'm wondering if is that their voices layered in the intro before Maggie's acoustic guitar comes in? There's that fade in note that's a long extended. It almost mm. sounds like their voices blended in a style not unlike 10 CC's I'm Not in Love. Well, I see on Discogs that Maggie Roche is credited with synthesizer as well. So I assume that there was synthesizer and vocals being blended together at the beginning. To my understanding, that's only on Quitting Time, the synthesizer. Oh, okay. Interesting. Do you know who programmed the synthesizer on this album for Maggie? I don't. A fellow by the name of Larry Fast. Oh, Larry Fast. Do we remember Um, who Larry Fast is? Synergy, yeah. Yeah, one of our earliest episodes with our guest Katie May. Larry Fast is Synergy. He programmed the synth. Which makes sense because he was in a band with Tony Levin, who is the bass player from King Crimson and also played bass on this record. Yep. Tony Levin from King Crimson. He also played with Peter Gabriel and Herbie Mann and many other people. We mentioned him previously on our Weather Report episode because he played the Chapman stick. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. And, yeah, I I didn't realize just how much Sesh how much session work Tony Levin had done. He's on all kinds of stuff. He saw right around this time he was on John Lennon and and Yoko Ono's Double Fantasy album. Interesting. On percussion, we have someone we talked about on our Daryl Hall and John Oates episode, 
the legendary Jimmy Malin, or however you say his name. <laughs> we didn't know that either, and I couldn't find out for this episode. M-A-E-L-E-N. He's on Triangle and Shaker. You can hear some triangle in that in the in Hammond song that we just listened to. And he was the first call percussion player in New York City for many years through the 70s and 80s. He was on, as I said, privatized by Hollow Notes. He also often contributed percussion to the extended 12-inch single versions of of songs like we just talked about that whole phenomenon on the Heat Wave episode about uh, the extended 12-inch versions will add in stuff and and he's it's actually the extended version of what a fool believes he's the additional percussion on that by the Doobie Brothers. Uh, I also just want to state that he has one solo record with a very wonderful punny title. It's called Beats Working, but that's B E A T S because he's a percussionist. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Sean's always a big fan of the uh, solo album pun titles. Yeah, I have no idea if that album's good or not. It probably is, but it's an excellent <laughs> title, at least. But overall, there's there's not many players on this album. We've pretty much covered it. You know, it's it, And this is produced by Fripp. It says Audio Verite, meaning that, the, Taylor, I'm sure you're familiar with Cinema Verite. Of course. Yeah, so it's the idea of isn't it the idea of kind of capturing something as it is rather than manipulating it too much? Yes. And I did read that he would tell them, just go work on these songs really, really hard and then come in and just play them as you would, you know? And they said that that was very, that worked really, really well for them. Um, that wasn't a way that they had work, recorded before, you know, the usual standard, just laying, like laying tracks. They didn't do it like that for this record. Yeah. So we're hearing a very immediate sounding recording. This is what the roaches sound like. Yeah. And I read that the, everything was done in one or two takes. Incredible. They're just, mm -hmm. their harmonies are unbelievably tight. And of course, we've talked about before, they're siblings, so it's that blood harmony. Mm -hmm. I think they're one of the best examples of that. Uh, Definitely. Some people, some reviews, and of course, we know critics are assholes, but some people you know, criticize them as not being particularly great vocalists from a traditional standpoint. And I have no sense of what great traditional vocals are. To me, they're among the most profound voices I've ever heard, especially all together. I agree. It's it's very affecting. Yeah. To me, I don't listen to it and think, oh, is this technically perfect or not? It's just it's very emotionally affecting. And the other thing I think about with this group is that aside from the, the blood harmony of the vocals, just the fact that they're siblings gives you this voyeuristic, for lack of a better word, feeling with it. You, you feel like you're getting allowed to like peek into the, this like private family life of these quirky, mm -hmm. interesting people. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting effect. It kind of reminds me almost of like some of like the, outsider music like maybe the shags but but the shags with like you know a little bit more stable and a lot more musical talent but it's that same kind of like peek into their private lives kind of feel when i first showed this group to a, a friend of mine nate hartman who's now a supporter of ours he said and I first, or my first reaction was, wow, the shags got really good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm not alone in thinking that then. Okay, cool. Well, yeah. also their their ranges are so different that I think it sounds different than in most sibling groups, I think, because I don't know. No one has a voice like Maggie Roach. I mean, no woman does. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. I've never heard a woman sing like that. No. <laughs> It's really unique. You know, she's the one that you can hear her very distinctly on Hammond's song when she says, on the wrong track, yeah. kind of towards the beginning. And then you, you start to pick out her voice when they're all harmonizing more and more. And you're like, oh, yeah, it's in there. Um, but Terry and Suzzy have, yeah, they, they have such different voices that Suzzy, I actually found, tends to a lot of the times be the one leading. I, I've actually learned from watching performances of them, uh, melodically, that is. Yeah, she's usually in the middle, too. Mm -hmm. I've read that because she doesn't play an instrument, it's Terry on guitar and also Maggie on guitar, she kind of considers herself the MC of the group. Mm -hmm. 
if you watch her live performances, you can definitely see that. Yeah, Terry does more of the lead work. And every so often, Suzy will pick up a guitar, but it's, yeah, Maggie's doing the rhythm, Terry's doing the lead, and then, yeah, Suzy's often standing there without a guitar. Mm -hmm. I really like watching her. She's very theatrical, um, maybe because she was studying acting, or but she is... She does a really good job of making up for the fact that she doesn't play an instrument, typically. Yeah, and she's married to Loudon Wainwright III. They actually were never married, but they do have oh, a child. Oh, they're not married. No, but they had a child together, Lucy okay. Wainwright Roach. Yeah. Who is the yes. half-sibling, half if you want to get into this, which we, I will, because um, <laughs> I find it very interesting, is uh, so, yes, yeah, so uh, Suzy Roach and Loudon Wainwright the third had a child together. That's Lucy Wainwright Roach, who are is half siblings with Martha Wainwright and Rufus Wainwright from Loudon Wainwright the third's prior marriage to Kate McGarrigal, who was in the McGarrigal sisters, who are great, and they're very similar oh, wow. to the Roaches in that way. So it's very and Rufus Wainwright went on to have a like well he's you know gay and he and his husband went and uh they have a daughter with um leonard cohen's daughter yeah but it's... yeah they share a daughter together and it's just this ma like major sort of weird late 70s folk dynasty that i think would make an excellent documentary or biopic yeah yeah we haven't covered a loud and wainwright the third album yet i've entertained the idea a few times but his stuff's pretty weird <laughs> yeah like... see that's getting to like a little i like him a lot because i mean if only for the swimming song that song's so great yeah he gets a little too much into the funny for me and it's dark <laughs> too <laughs> yeah yeah anyway but i think that it, it's just yeah they were all in that scene i guess anyway yeah very specific little niche mm -hmm. in the music industry well taylor what happens to the roaches after this album this is just their debut so yeah uh they had this record it did really well i think the new york times and other publications were calling it like the best album of the year when it came out you know it was only april it was released in april 1979 so they were calling it that even at that point they did well they um they toured a lot, and they were all on TV a bunch. If you go on their website, by the way, whoever was running that, it's one of the sisters, but they are very were, did a very good job of chronicling their TV performances, which you can watch a lot of them on their website. Um, so they, yeah, they were on The Late Show. They were on Dick Cavett's show. That per, that interview is really fun. Um, they <laughs> well, they're so they're really good together. Like because he's like you know. He's so funny and I think gets them more than anyone else that they interviewed with. Uh, but then after that, they released a lot of records. I think maybe like four or five in the 80s, all of which I think are great. And yeah, like you said, Robert Fripp produced their third record, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah, he did not produce Nerds, their second album. Yeah. They all, none of them did as well as this one. And I think eventually they were kicked off their label. And then they continue making uh, music through the '90s, and then I think maybe in, I think maybe in the late '90s they decided like, okay, let's like put a stop to this. And then they kind of are all doing their own thing, performing maybe as duos and you know solo, but never together again publicly. Um, I did want to say though that uh, Suzy Roach was an actress as well. Um, didn't do too many things, but she's in this movie called Crossing Delancey, which I love. It's directed uh, by a woman named Joan Micklin Silver. And it's from 1988, and Suzy Roach has a supporting role in that, and she's so funny and so good. And uh, the, the Roaches did the soundtrack to it. Oh, nice. And Yeah, and it's great. Yeah, sadly, Maggie is no longer with us. Yeah, so that's another story I have. Ugh. So I work as I'm a music supervisor, as I've told your audience many times now but I was working on a show with Tiffany Anders who's the woman I work with and I'm her coordinator on her projects but we were working on a show called You're the Worst back in 2016 and we were using we wanted to use the Hammond song in a scene 
And, uh, you know, I looked up who owned the rights, and you do that on this website called BMI or ASCAP, and it lists who the publisher is. A lot of times it's like a major label, but this time it just had an email address, and we emailed, and we're like, we'd like to use your song, like, you know, get in touch with us. We can go over the details, and Maggie Roach wrote us back, and this was in December of 2016. So we were both Tiffany and I are fans. We're thrilled, you know, that we got to, like, actually interact with her, Um, and she was very lovely and, you know, and nice and and so, yeah, we used the song in an episode, and then only a month later, we had no idea, but she had had cancer, and she died within, like, a, three weeks of us talking to her. Wow. Wow. It was, yeah, and I was very, I was so sad. But, yeah, I guess, like, she was very, she's a very private, per, was a very private person, um, according to her sisters, and she, no one knew that, except her family. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and sadly, her son, Felix McTeague, who's mm-hmm. also a musician, died in 2020 just a few years after she oh. passed away so, that's very yeah, sad th- i did not know that yeah i just learned that in researching there there wasn't a lot of information out there about it but i did find that so yeah but terry and suzzy mm-hmm. are still with us yeah i think they're still performing you know i follow them on follow the roaches on facebook i think it's ran by suzzy so they post you know occasionally they're performing one of them will be performing at some small venue out where they live, like in the East Coast. They never get out here ever, which makes me out sad. Out to L.A.? I've always wanted to see them. Yeah. I always watch out for it, but they never do. Well, I think it's high time to feature the next selection, which is The Married Men, where we talked about previously that Phoebe Snow had a version of this, that recorded a version of this song. And mm-hmm. it's probably... a because of that, one of the better known Roach's songs. This is The Married Men. <laughs> Side B, track two. <laughs> It makes sense to me that Phoebe Snow would pick that song to cover because some of the way they deliver the vocals actually kind of remind me of the way that Phoebe Snow sings. It's a real natural fit there. So Phoebe would have had a hit with that less than a year before this record came out. She covered it in 1978. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't love that version that she has on her record. It's a little too jaunty for me. Yeah, that's not my favorite Phoebe Snow record in general, honestly. But the way that she and Linda Ronstadt sing it 
on SNL is very, it's much more in line with the Roaches version. I think that version's really beautiful. Yeah. This one starts with Maggie singing the lead on the first verse, and then Suzzy is the second verse. And of course, yeah, Maggie, it almost has this like Irish folk ballad mm-hmm. quality to it. And of course, th- this is an example of the Roaches sometimes have this sort of coy winking aspect to their music and this is definitely in that vein yeah and she mentions they mention louisiana again so this makes me think that if I, we weren't all if we didn't already suspect i you know i think that this is probably autobiographical <laughs> <laughs> yeah because yes as we mentioned before they had spent some time in louisiana before this record came out yeah they they deal with interesting topics that you don't necessarily hear about in a lot of songs yeah they're very personal they're not um but they i feel like they have they're very accessible but they're also they're not very broad in terms of their themes like they're not necessarily universal themes they're not yeah necessarily... exactly <laughs> yeah they're just like you know they're based on experience their experience they're like sort of little character driven, you know, vin- like short stories almost. Yeah. And if you watch live performances, the they'll sometimes tell a little bit of a, a story of how the song came to be or something that happened as a result of the song too. <laughs> sometimes mm-hmm. it's after the fact, the, the song affected people this way. It's a, and, and that's, they, they kind of have that it's casual vaudevillian quality to their performances. I really have to think that being a fan of theirs in like the late seventies, early eighties must have felt like you were in on the best kept secret around like this real intimate feeling of getting into this group. Cause they put it all out there, like you said, but it's also cryptic at the same time and very mm-hmm. specific. Yeah, for sure. Did you guys find music like this music for others? Well, I mentioned them earlier, but I think Kate and Anna McGarrigal are a good comparison to the Roaches, uh, not only because of their familial ties, but they were also sisters recording music in the late 70s with the folk pop aspect to it, with a lot of harmony, and I think their approach to their lyrics is pretty similar. Um, So yeah, their self-titled record, Kate and Anna McGarrigal, has a song on it actually called heart like a wheel which linda ronstadt also covers so full circle there yeah i suggest that i do i mean even though we were kind of ragging on loud and we weren't the third i think his album attempted mustache uh is really good and it has also has a great title (laughs) (laughs) i don't i don't know if i want to yeah I like Loud and Wainwright the Third, and I respect him, but his humor stuff just doesn't quite work for me like it does with the Roaches. Mm-hmm. Well, that one I do think that that one has a few good songs on it. Yeah. And let's see. Uh, I was thinking about this record. It's actually one that I've considered bringing to the table for a future episode, maybe. Um, it's by this guy named Steve Forbert, and it's called Jack Rabbit Slim from 1979. Also, I've seen that around, but I have never it's, listened it's to it. It's good. Okay. It's really good has a song on it called Romeo's Tune. That's really awesome. And he's doing sort of a similar thing, too. So those are the three that came to my mind. Oh, also, I wanted to mention, sorry to keep going back and forth, but uh, Terry Roach was also on Robert Fripp's album, uh, Exposure, in 1980, I think. She sings sings on a few of those songs. And uh, also, did you know that they were on a Philip Glass record? I did not know that. Which is crazy. I didn't. Whoa, I didn't <laughs> yeah. thought that either. Yeah, they sing on a they sing on a Philip Glass album from 1987, I think, that Laurie Anderson also sings on, which is just so crazy to me. <laughs> we should probably, while I'm thinking about it, mention that they were on Tiny Tune Adventures. Oh I just watched the clips from it this morning. It's so. It's like, who? Did they know? Is it just because of their last name and that's it? Or it's like, but what child would watch that and know? They play, so yeah, yeah, they, the roaches play cockroach versions of themselves in this episode, but it's, they're in the entire episode. (laughs) It's the entire episode is about them. Wow. That's so strange. Yeah. But what child would like, you know, pick up on that joke? Yeah. 
<laughs> if you were a child watching that and that was somehow actually your introduction to the roaches and you're a fan now because of that, please tell us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like uh, SpongeBob SquarePants was based on the album The Mollusk by Ween. And they, they even had a Ween song in the movie. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of funny music. Ugh, it's it's just like what? What what kid what kid would pick up on that? <laughs> well, uh, yeah. funny you should mention that because SpongeBob was definitely the first place I heard Tiny Tim. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, speaking of funny music, uh, that uh, can be right. quite polarizing. <laughs> That's wild. So back to recommended albums. Yeah, Sean, though. did you have a few? Yes. Okay. So we, we've mentioned Phoebe Snow a bunch of times and the record that we don't like of hers, but the one that I highly recommend is an album called Second Childhood from 1976. Um, I've been wanting to do a Phoebe Snow record for a while. I think she's got some really cool songs, mm-hmm. some, some not so great stuff, but uh, when she's when she's on, it's incredible. And then kind of a left field pick that I think works surprisingly well is the Pointer Sisters. We have another sister group that made some kind of vaudevillian quirky music at times, but when they weren't doing that, they were making, you know, disco and funk. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have a record called Steppin' from 1975 that is really cool. The first half is more of that, like, mid-70s funk, and then the second half gets into the, like, vaudevillian and show tunes influenced and uh, highly recommended. And then last one, Maria Muldor's 1973 self-titled album, has some Is that parallels. Midnight at the Oasis on it. Yeah, yeah, I has, love that song. Midnight at the Oasis. <laughs> That's a great album. The whole album is really. It is good. really yeah. good. And I also just want to note that um, the Paul Simon Masterclass that we mentioned, mm-hmm. Maria was actually one of the people who had won a legitimate seat in that class when the Maria Mildar. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah, when the Roaches busted in and started singing. That's interesting because Maria Mildar was it. Uh, she performed with her husband Jeff Mildar. They had a couple. They had a couple records together before she went solo. So I wonder if those records came out before or after she took that. Well, class. and I guess it's possible that maybe she had been in like a different class that uh, Paul had done. If he did more than mm-hmm. one, uh, I just know that she had one entry to uh, one of his songwriting classes cool. that he did. Okay. And that's my list of recommended albums. Fantastic! Thank you both. We would like to take a moment to say our Patreon push for February is over. Thank you to everyone who signed up or existing patrons who bumped up their tier. Thank A lot of participation and the window to receive the cool exclusive limited edition gifts has now closed, but you can still always sign up for our Patreon and support the podcast at patreon.com slash i buy that podcast or you can find the link in the show notes lots of cool content if you like what you're hearing there's more there's more out there for you but uh let's uh let's turn the focus to taylor tell people where else they can hear you besides for i'd buy that for a dollar taylor well you can hear my radio show every fourth thursday on nts radio Um, on their app, which is, you know, just go to your app store and download that, or you can go to nts.live, or you can hear it after the fact on my website, which is called the wind, uh, it's windmillsofyourmind.org, which also happens to be the name of the radio show. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. So I think if you like the roaches, you'll probably like my radio show. Yeah. They probably have made a few appearances over the years. They have. Um, yeah. And then... Yeah, that's where you can hear me. And then I don't know if we want to talk about my work. Yes, let's talk about your <laughs> well, work. Let's okay. specifically <laughs> let's let's talk about your work as a music coordinator and a music supervisor. Yeah. Well, I'll just push Pen Fifteen again because that's out. But the last season of Pen Fifteen, I co music supervised an episode on that. So if you haven't watched it yet, I you should. Yeah, that episode felt the most like a complete departure from the rest of the series to me. And it felt like a mini movie, almost like a mini film. Mm -hmm. Um, I loved that episode. That was probably my favorite episode of the entire series. The one that's about, about Maya's mother. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I paid attention to all the 
music that was happening and, and just knowing the painstaking work that went into acquiring the rights to those obscure Japanese songs. That, yeah. You mentioned it the last time that you were on. Yeah, I was living on Japanese Standard Time as well as Pacific Standard Time for a few months. <laughs> and then the closing episode of the series made me head to completely reconsider how I feel about the Santana Rob Thomas song Smooth. <laughs> <laughs> it really did. I it's You and me I, both. <laughs> <laughs> um I was never liked that song, hated it when it came out. It felt like it was on the radio for years. Yeah, um, it, it was. It was like standard that every 45 minutes it had to be played. Yeah. And uh, we, you know, they wrote it into the script, I believe. And I was like, oh, God, I can't. And uh, and then, you know, I didn't I was still not convinced the entire time until I saw the episode. And I I have a I have a new affection. I have a affection for it. And it's not a new affection. It's just <laughs> um, I think that they it works. It's fair. It works really well in the in the in the episode. Yeah, and that that last episode gets dark. Very dark. <laughs> yeah. But it's a great show, Pen15. It's available on Hulu. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, really one of my favorite shows of the last few years. So I'm so cool that you got to work on that show. I'm sure it was quite an experience. Yeah, it was really fun. I just started the second season recently, so I'm very excited to get to the Taylor episode and get to the finale and... Uh, discover a new appreciation appreciation for smooth <laughs> i was young enough when yeah. that song came out where it, i didn't necessarily love it but i was like oh this is a cool song whatever i think my dad bought that cd and we'd listen to it all the time in the car so <laughs> i wasn't old enough yeah. to be too cool for that song yet Ugh, i hated every song <laughs> off that yeah that was yeah. a huge album too there were a number of hits off of it what's the other one like Maria, Maria, or whatever. Yep, that one's on there. You look just like a movie star. I hate that song. And then he 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 did like a sequel to it with more features, and I think he did a POD song on the sequel, and I was way into that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I yeah. went not to get to like we can just cut this, but I <laughs> I hadn't thought about POD in twenty years, and I was at the bowling alley with uh, Alec Bowen a couple weeks ago, and I. Uh, Youth of a Nation is that a song mm -hmm. by them? Yeah, it came was, on, and was I was like, song, yeah. I was, I could not, be, I, I have not thought of that song in twenty years. I couldn't believe, uh, I don't know, that I have been able to forget a song so thoroughly. <laughs> I mean, there was but, pretty good reason to thoroughly forget. Yeah, that Yeah, but you know what? I was list, I was listening to it, and I was like, you know, there's going to be a trailer soon that uses that song, and it's going to be sung by a woman in like a, you know, that sort of goth broken baby doll oh voice God, that is very yes. popular in yeah, trailers totally. now yeah it'll probably be in like a trailer for euphoria or something right <laughs> like or an action movie where it's like it's, <laughs> yeah. it's real edgy and atmospheric and then it ends with the uh the big action sequences perfectly yeah. timed up to the drum beats that's exactly right. how it's gonna go yeah yeah can't yep. wait it's gonna be awesome okay <laughs> All right, from the roaches to POD. That's it. This oh. is where I saw this episode going. <laughs> cool. Well, what are we going to end with? We are going to end with Quitting Time, fittingly. Mm -hmm. As we mentioned, this song features the synthesizer programmed by Larry Fast and played by Maggie Roach. It's it's kind of subtle, like a lot of the additional instrumentation on this. The yeah, this is a fitting closer. This is another one, another album where it's so hard to to choose just four to feature because it's it. This album is a like a complete statement, and, and the sequencing is incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think yeah, I think this one shows off their harmonies very well. Yeah, so. yep, comes right in strong with them. Mm -hmm. I don't have anything else to say about the Roaches other than check them out if you like this album. Everything I've heard is good. I, I still have plenty of their catalog to explore myself. Yeah, I love Nerds. I love Keep On Doing. I love Speak and Another World. Those are all excellent. And I found every single Roaches album that I own at a thrift store. Yeah, I was so. gonna say this is definitely a very easy band to find in the mm -hmm. bargain bin. So if you enjoyed this, you're in luck. Yeah, I bought my copy at Vertigo in Grand Rapids 
two or three months ago for five dollars so it's still out there cheap you paid too much <laughs> sean there's inflation happening doesn't exist there's no inflation it's just corporate <laughs> greed at the record store <laughs> oh no vertigo you're cool with us <laughs> <laughs> all right well thank you so much taylor for yeah. coming back yet again and talking about the roaches yeah thanks for having me i'm jeremy ruggles I'm punching out. I'm it's quitting time. Sean Hartman. It's also quitting time, so I gotta, I gotta go. <laughs> yep, I'm Peter Cook. Gotta hit the road. And I'm Taylor Rowley. I'm out. <laughs> out. <laughs> quitting time. Enough of